right, so I'm going to pass it over to John who can get us started. Okay. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. Um, as I, so I, my research um, and my PhD was actually, so I started in Nebraska, University of Nebraska Lincoln. I did a PhD and postdoc there. Um, and this Healthy Farm Index was part of that. It's this kind of interesting secondary project that we've gotten a lot of traction with, um, a lot of engagement. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about how it evolved, um, where we're going next, and, and why we think, you know, kind of moving from just, you know, more research um, into how do we actually create behavior change and, and some of these ideas. So what I want to do in, in three parts, and um, Jessica, if I run long, let me know, because there's more here than I, I'm um, trying to summarize a lot of things in one small capacity. Um, I want to, you know, as an ecologist, think about where does the Healthy Farm Index fit into this niche of different farm assessment tools. There's a lot of them out there. They all serve different functions, um, and I think a lot of them are complementary. And so, you know, when I kind of compare and contrast what we have uh, thank you, to some of the other opportunities, uh, we will, you know, it's, it's not saying that these aren't right. It's more that here's, you know, something to complement what's already being done. Next, I want to kind of just briefly describe its original function. Uh, we've published two papers on, on, on the index, so how we've used it. Um, but um, with some funding from the Organic Center, we've kind of had this opportunity to maybe realize something bigger as to what it can be. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. So, um, like I said, there are a lot of farm assessment tools out there. Uh, we published ours in 2013, and, and I could think of half a dozen or a dozen more out there. What's kind of cool about it is I think they all reflect something different, where a researcher comes from. Um, whether it's from a soil perspective, a social science perspective, air quality, profit, um, erosion. I mean, I think, you know, they all, like I said, they all complement one another. Where we felt this idea was, was lacking was a couple of different things. Um, there's the fantastic soil and water assessment tool. Um, you know, that's a good, rigorous application, but it's not necessarily farmer friendly. Um, and it focuses on the abiotic components of the ecosystem. Uh, the Land Stewardship Project um, in the 90s published the Monitoring Toolbox. A great assessment tool, um, you know, kind of this useful bit of metric, some you know, monitoring these ideas, uh, but wasn't necessarily backed up by data at that point. You know, how, how, what are these? What should we monitor? And how do we move forward? In the last three, well, say uh, now ten years, as it gets longer and longer, on the field print calculator, we were just talking about this earlier. Another great tool, um, but has gotten in some respects more complicated, and the stewardship index one focuses on specialty crops. Uh, this is, you know, this idea of biodiversity and organic agriculture, um, you know, part of the organic certification is monitoring this. So you can think of this as one sort of assessment tool. Um, I sat on the review board for the OCA chapter in Nebraska, kind of seeing how farmers assess themselves, uh, kept each other in check. And one thing I noticed in that process, again, all kind of building up to this same point. Oh, we lost one image there is, you know, if you if I zoomed in here, you would see a question about biodiversity. Um, it's a mere yes or no. Is biodiversity conservation part of this operation? So our, our interest um, is in this niche of a farmer friendly um, field and farm scale index tool that focuses on biodiversity and ecosystem services. That's a relatively narrow definition, but we felt that that wasn't one that was addressed well. Um, there are, again, there are good tools for that. Um, this is INVEST from the Natural Capital Project. Um, here it is looking at the value of biodiversity, so habitat quality or the provision of different ecosystem services. But this is, a, again, a larger scale. Uh, this is, you know, farmers don't manage at a county scale. They're managing their land. Uh, and lastly, um, just as kind of, again, in this, in this world of different communities of farm assessment tools, you know, here, this, this is a project, the People and Ecosystems Watershed Integration, um, put together by folks at Iowa State. And this is, this is great, because it's really interactive. It gets farmers moving things around and kind of gives them some, um, some ownership in how this might play out. Um, if you haven't seen this, they have a web app built around it, and it gives some nice outputs. But it's really a futuring. It's not something to go in and assess your own farm. 
So, um, I, as I said, we we came up with this idea, and I should give credit to, there's lots of different people who've been involved. Um, my advisors for my dissertation were Ron Johnson and Jim Brando. They really came up with this first idea. Um, it's kind of nice to come back here in um, 2016. Uh, we presented the first paper on the Healthy Farm Index back in 2007 at the Farm In with Grass Conference, um, which was right down the road here. And in 2013, in um, Journal of Agricultural Sustainability, um, we, we published kind of our idea. And so we, we, to fill this open niche, we identify this idea of you know, biodiversity, and we defined it broadly. Um, you know, so genes, species, and ecosystems. I mean, what sort of processes or things could farmers easily measure that are trackable and you can see change? And we thought about this as you know, agriculture for biodiversity and kind of phrasing how we present it. Um, and then the other side of that, um, you know, this idea of ecosystem services, a horrible term, uh, but one that has taken hold in the literature. And so, you know, what benefits does nature provide back to the farm? Or what does the farm itself, beyond food production, provide to the larger community? Uh, I did just, I, I do find it helpful to, to kind of define biodiversity. Um, I get in um, arguments with my own colleagues about specifically what it is. Um, I would, with the opening session this morning, you know, the idea of biodiversity as an ecosystem service, um, we really want to, I guess, try and step away from that and think of biodiversity as what provides ecosystem services. So everything from genetic diversity, you know, here's different wheat varieties from up in Nebraska. Um, there's a great article if you haven't read it, The Sterile Banana. And you look here, you know, genetic resources, you know, are one of the more economically important services. Um, species diversity and here, you know, building on some of the past work, the idea of plan versus associated diversity. Um, and so this is Larry Stanislaus farm. He has gorgeous stripped crops that help prevent this erosion, uh, but has this four or five year crop rotation. Um, and then my interest in kind of how I got into this was the idea, you know, how can we protect birds? Um, you know, we started with birds, but we wanted to build it up to all these other contexts. And so birds became one indicator of species diversity among many. Um, and then largely, or lastly, ecosystem diversity. Uh, this is, I, I love this figure, kind of captures the complexity of, of what different farm types are, but why it's so hard to assign one value. And so when, when we do the Healthy Farm Index, we stress that it's not about comparing one farm to the other. Um, it's not about giving you know, Larry the ability to walk down and say that, Liz, my farm is better than yours because I have five birds and 10 crops. Um, each of these represents a different landscape type. Um, I'm from Minnesota originally, which is where this landscape is. Um, and you know, this section compared to this section has a different history, a different context, different things it can do. Um, if just for reference, this is Kansas with its center pivots, Germany, Bolivia, Southeast Asia, and Brazil. And so they all, you know, this is a great kind of cultural, ecological context figure, but it addresses the complexity and why I stress we should not try and use a tool like this to compare and say one is better than the other. You know, when we think of why, why is biodiversity important, you know, and how did these come together? Um, if, you know, this is an idea, and uh, I, your advisor um, put this together. Uh, the idea, you know, ecosystem services come from both planned and associated biodiversity. And so farmers, I think, in my experience, they most often relate with the planned biodiversity. If we can start helping them understand how that influences the associated biodiversity and ultimately that promotes conditions that benefit everybody. Um, and so that's, this is kind of a nice framework that we work within. And then, you know, again, why, why do we need something like this? I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but this is that Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And I like to give credit, I mean, agriculture has done amazing things to produce more food than we ever have before. And that's our ecosystem service that's doing well and you know all the others not not quite so well and so we need to you know we, we have success you know being you know at a land grant university in the midwest you have to give credit to those successes but we have to improve on that so um the healthy farm index as it's undergone various permutations and i think some of that reflects you know as we've evolved as we've learned um, but i think it reflects this idea that it's not necessarily about what the indicators are but more how it's used and that's my my point that we'll get to so when, when you run the Healthy Farm Index, um, you know, you, we have a series of different plots depending on what program you're using, you know, to say where you're doing well, what you're not doing well. This is my advisor's farm. This is um, the UNL, UNL Agroforestry Research Farm. Um, it does well on some things and not well on the others. And so, you know, here kind of communicating where that is with the goal that maybe over time, you know, they might make adjustments and say, here's something we can improve, here's something maybe we're happy with it, or what's that right balance? 
Um, you can compare between different farms, but again, you know, this isn't necessarily something we want to see done. We don't think it's necessarily helpful because um, it, it uh, you know, we, we kind of went into this saying maybe it would be cool if instead of talking about yields at the coffee shop, they talked about how many birds they saw. Um, and that creates different social norms and things like that. So there's a place for it, but again, not necessarily comparing variation between farms. There's other things that are forcing that. You can summarize those scores broadly. Um, again, here's two more farms that we worked with. Uh, you know, you can see the one on the left, more heterogeneous. Uh, these are both organic farms and um, a both in central Nebraska, uh, but different choices that they made on how they're going to farm. And what's nice here, it kind of shows, I mean, the index not surprisingly shows what we want it to show. Uh, so our, what we've gone from there is, you know, how do we make this interactive um, in the sense that we want farmers to use it. This is not something I, you know, that we want me or somebody else to have to go out and work with them. We want it to be interactive. We built an Excel spreadsheet. Um, we found that, you know, when we'd send that out, it wasn't necessarily used, or if it was used, we had no idea how they used it. So we kind of walked away from that a little bit. Um, uh, we moved it online. Uh, we built a Google Docs, which, works pr which worked pretty well, uh, where we were able to you know, s share that gut to Google Doc, and then we can kind of track that over time. But again, slightly cumbersome. Um, in the same way, though, you, know, you can kind of get some measures, some indicators here. Google built some fancy dials. You could say, hey, you're doing well, without really being quantitative about it. Um, as, as a quantitative ecologist, I, I mean, sometimes this makes me uncomfortable, but I'll, ultimately my last point, I think, shows the value of, of this. So with some funding um, from the UNFI Foundation and Organic Center, uh, we've actually built a new interactive website for this, and so we're hoping to launch that soon, uh, where it's much more controllable than what our Google Doc was. Um, it's not sensitive, where if someone presses a button, it totally ruins a whole spreadsheet. Um, and so this is something we're gonna hopefully roll out in the near future. It's ready to go, we just gotta figure out all the details. So, I told you that lots of different assessment tools, um, what are they for? Uh, that's kind of it. So let me, why, why are they important? Um, in this context, biodiversity is being lost. Um, this is, I mean, this is a biodiversity session, um, but we should keep that in reality where, you know, we're losing species now at three orders of magnitude faster than we have before. Um, and I, I always like to rotate the Rockstrom plot here because um, I tend to put climate change up at the top and say it's the most important. But if you look at which planetary boundary we've crossed, it's biodiversity. I mean, it's interesting going back to that genetic diversity idea too. And uh, they, they updated this to say it's genetic diversity that's most at threat. Um, and then functional diversity is kind of an unknown. So um, biodiversity is something under underpresented, under assessed, and, uh, but desperately needs our help to address. Why do we want to conserve biodiversity? Uh, you know, this is why we need to work with farmers. Um, for my dissertation, I looked at how farm landscapes influence bird abundance and diversity. The reason this is so valuable or so important, you know, so much terrestrial ice, 40% of terrestrial ice-free surface is covered with agriculture, and so these are systems we have to work with. This is Errol Ellis' anthromes, um, where all the brown represents cropland and rangeland. So this global extent, we have to work within the system. We can't just go protect birds or plants or anything else in parks or in our um, set-aside lands or protected areas. We have to work with farmers. And so we want a tool that they get engaged. This is, you know, the organic focus. I mean, this is a mandate within organic farming, but if you go back to what the, at least for OCIA, their check is, do you do things to conserve biodiversity, yes or no? There's not a lot of evidence there, a lot of data. My predecessor in Nebraska, um, Nancy Beecher, she looked at organic uh, uh, bird abundance and diversity in organic and non-organic systems. Twice as many birds, twice as many species, and this, um, holds nicely across different systems. Uh, you can summarize those here, you know, where, you know, our 53 out of 63 studies. You know, this has obviously been updated, but that same sort of trend continues. Uh, we added to that looking at, you know, how heterogeneity in the landscape benefited birds, um, how different um, specific management practices, what needed to be done. I mean, so we have a lot of data in this context, and that, that was kind of our original goal of the Healthy Farm Index. How can we get farmers to help participate in this process? It, it, it works out pretty well, but it's not data. Um, what we want to work on next is maybe what we see the kind of the evolution of the Healthy Farm Index. So Healthy Farm Index Part 2, what are we going to do? 
this idea, and it, we we can learn from natural systems. This idea that we know what to do. Uh, you know, this is John Foley's figure looking at you know how natural ecosystems compare to intensive croplands, and this is where we want to be. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so, is that all it takes just to kind of say, oh, this is where we want to be? This idea that. Um, environmental knowledge, so we know what we know, and if we tell the right people, it'll change their behavior. Is, is it that simple? Um, we've, we've been starting this in upstate South Carolina, so we started there four years ago. Um, and, you know, have started interviewing farmers, kind of where their perceptions. Um, these are a couple of quotes where we went out and interviewed farmers, like, why do they think nature is important? Um, and we asked, you know, these, these are what they said. But we found this interesting gap between they could articulate the knowledge, but that didn't change their behaviors. Um, they still kind of farmed the same way they had before. Um, and so my wife is um, a social scientist and kind of pushed me in this context to say, okay, how do we translate environmental behavior, um, environmental knowledge to environmental behavior? She has these fantastic models where we take, um, I want to highlight two parts here, um, problem awareness. So we know we're losing biodiversity. How do we get to behavior change? This is our goal. Um, to get through, to get to those points, we have a couple of different things we have to work through. You know, there's social norms. So, what are you talking about at the coffee shop? Uh, what is your attitude towards different things? Uh, what's ultimately your intention? Why do you want to do a particular practice or behavior? Um, in the same context here, uh, you know, the same sort of model where you're seeing, you know, here's again awareness of the consequences and you know I, I think I changed that in the farmers I worked with my favorite story is you know the farmer who would get off his tractor have his shovel he would move the little killdeer nest to one row over and then keep cultivating but did that really change his behaviors broadly probably not and that's when you know again we're working with organic farmers which is a relatively unique group my favorite story is I was working on one organic farm and I stepped over the conventional farmers uh, onto the neighbor's land he came barely down his tractor, started yelling at me, like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, we're, we're trying to save birds. He was like, ah, oh, you go do that in Nature Conservancy land. So the organic farmers are a good place to start, but ultimately maybe we want this to be with a bigger group. So um, our, our interest is with the Healthy Farm Index going forward, how do we take this farm assessment tool and go from this point where we have awareness of consequences to changing social norms, to changing attitudes, to changing these perceived behavioral controls in order to improve and increase the likelihood of adopting environmentally friendly behaviors. And so in this context, you know, in, uh, the language here, you know, antecedents of pro-environmental behavior, that's what we're interested in. Um, so if farmers feel like, you know, this is something they can do, something they should do, they're more likely to do it. And so how, how do we get to that point? Um, can we form habits? So when farmers cultivate, what they're watching, what they're aware of. Um, in this context, you know, what data they're collecting. So they're not just collecting data on yield. They're collecting data on the broader system of their farm. Um, and then what are those social norms? And I, I think it's important here too, because I can collect this data. I've collected this data and I've given it to farmers. Um, but that's kind of bypassing, if you go back to those models, that's bypassing problem awareness and me telling them what the environmental behavior should be. So we feel the Healthy Farm Index, as it's designed, can kind of fill that middle spot of that model. Interestingly, um, this aligns well with, I think, two areas of other research, which I'm uh, looking forward to digging into more. One, this idea of citizen science, um, you know, how, whether it's eBird or um, I don't know if some of the urban bee work is, you know, that engages people in the process. And so if we can have, you know, not just, you know, these minimal level involvement for citizen science, but have farmers actually, you know, making observations, collecting data, submitting that data, does that change how they perceive it? Um, in the same way that active learning um, in, the te in the classroom, I mean, there's all this discussion like lecture, which you know, what we're standing here doing is not necessarily the best way to transmit knowledge. You know, how does that fit into how we change the likelihood of um, pro-environmental -envir behaviors being adopted? So what are, what's next for us? Um, we have a couple of research questions. Um, does use of the Healthy Farm Index, and I should say this for, in, you know, in any context or any other farm assessment tool, um, change the antecedents of pro-environmental behaviors? Uh, so what we're going to, well, I'll talk about that in a, a moment. Um, does it increase the adoption of pro-environmental behaviors? You know, so it may change their knowledge. But does it actually change what they do? Because uh, that's ultimately the goal. And does, does any change at that farm scale ultimately create benefits, whether at the farm?
farm, the watershed, or the regional scale. Um, and so we're up here in um, the northern part of South Carolina. It was interesting that we were at least one of the lowest states for organic funding. Um, there's not a lot of farms there. It's kind of been a shift from going from Nebraska where it was 96% agricultural land to now, actually in our county, we went through and measured it. It's less than 0.1%. So we're having a little bit of trouble finding farms. It's a different story, different context, but still we, can, we have a good group to work with here. So what we've um, what we want to do is is you know we've we want to make the healthy farm index engaging so that farmers can use it. Um, we've built a survey to kind of ask what are some of these other components, some other these questions. So if we asked you know here's what you did, here's how you monitored. Our hope is that we can kind of track these farmers over time. Um, did their at these different stages of knowledge, attitudes, and ultimately behavior change? How did those shift over a two to three year period? And I had one other slide in there, so let me take a step back. We're going to be doing this. Uh, we're going to the Moses meeting to work with farmers um, in the Midwest in February. Um, we're going to be having a webinar um, in February as well. Um, and then finally, we have a small group in our um, back home we were just talking about who are going to work with us to kind of track all of these different measures. So if, if, you're, if you know someone who might be inclined to do something like this, um, we need them and a friend because we want one person to use it um, and we want one person not to use it. Uh, this is, you know, trying to turn this into something quantitative. So does monitoring farm biodiversity and ecosystem services change pro-environmental behaviors is where we think the most value at this point in the index is. <coughs> so um, two more slides. One, I think Wendell Berry has it right. You know, this is not a competition between conservationists and agrarians. Uh, ultimately, working together is where we will be successful. Um, I feel, you know, I... That there's lots of good things in this. You know, it's it's not about competing. So we can find where these mutualisms are. That's a good thing. And then lastly, um, I should. I mean, lots and lots of collaborators on this over time. I think it's interesting. It's probably been almost ten years now since we've kind of been working on this in the background at different times. Lots and lots of cooperating farmers. They ultimately keep me in check when I say, "Oh, this would be awesome." You know, like, "No, nah, I will never do that." Um, <laughs> and so that and that's key because we don't want this. I mean, one of the, the strongest criticisms we got, you know, we had this, we had our academic paper published online. Someone read, they're like, oh, that's not for farmers. I was like, no, that's not the paper for you. I had to write that one. It's just, you know, our metric. Um, so we want this to be for farmers. Um, and then lots of different funding sources over time. And, you know, the two in bold are the one that, you know, in the last year have really helped us kind of jump back on this and hopefully propel it forward. So with that, um, I'll take any questions and, or do we want to wait until the end? Okay. Hey, Fantastic. So Thank you. Thank you.